the less these materials are subject to harmful handling and damage. And it also saves additional funds for us because we don't have to process as many applications for use of our materials. But we also want to make sure that our school children, the teachers, the parents, and the scholars have access to these extraordinary collections that we have in Washington. Our first secretary, Joseph Henry, was legally charged with preserving the records of the Smithsonian Institution. The Smithsonian Institution archive holdings constitute the official memory of the Smithsonian and document the development of American sciences, arts, culture, and technology. The United States is one of the most advanced countries in the world in terms of providing access, public use, for public information. U.S. policies and professional ethics are focused on the widest, most equitable openness for archival holdings. However, many of our collections remain inaccessible for a host of reasons. Insufficient staff, lack of expertise to work on special formats, or special language materials. In addition, some institutions have large backlogs of uncatalog uncatalogued or unprocessed materials, and we need to work on that. I look forward to the Smithsonian's Institution's collaboration with my colleagues at the Library of Congress and the National Archives. We each play an important role in inspiring the public by engaging them in an exploration of what it means to be an American in today's world. For 163 years, the Smithsonian Institution has built the national collections, disseminated innovative research, and welcomed millions of visitors to its museums, creating a reputation so strong that the Smithsonian is known as a symbol of America throughout the world. I'm extremely proud of our passionate and dedicated people and our volunteers, and we'll continue to work to see that that progress is made uh, is the same as we go forward. Again, thanks to the chair and the ranking member for my opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony, Dr. Clough, and thank you so much for being here. Dr. Billington, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Turn on your microphone. Yes, yes, sorry. There you go. Mr. Chairman, Mr. McHenry, members of the subcommittee. Appreciate very much being invited to appear before the subcommittee with two such distinguished leaders as the Smithsonian Secretary Wayne Clough and the new archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Um, uh, Ferrier. We wish Mr. Ferriero well in his new job and look forward to working with him. The Library of Congress is America's oldest federal cultural institution, and we've had good relations for many years with the Smithsonian and the archives, whose different collections <laughs> and missions generally complement ours. We all face, however, similar, similar challenges to acquire, preserve, and make accessible important primary materials and to serve both researchers and the general public. Congress, Mr. Chairman, has been the greatest patron of the library in the history of the world, building up for 209 years the world's largest, most comprehensive, and multi-formatted library covering some 470 languages stored on more than 650 miles of shelving and relentlessly adding 10,000 new analog items daily. Our top priority is to serve the research needs of Congress, which we do with our Congressional Research Service, providing objective, comprehensive research and analysis on policy matters, um, and responding last year to nearly 900,000 research and reference requests from the Congress. Our law library is the foreign law research arm of Congress, and we serve Congress in other ways, uh, lending books to members and staff, archiving veterans' oral histories collected through members' offices, and providing a special members' reading room and the beautiful members' room for meetings in the Jefferson Building exclusively for members' use. Since we are also the de facto National Library of the United States, our second major priority is serving the American people. Last year, we responded to over half a million public reference requests in our 21 reading rooms, circulated 22 million free Braille, and recorded books and magazines to disabled patrons all over the country through local libraries, and, f and fielded uh, more than 6.5 billion electronic transactions on the library's free educational website, which contains nearly 16 million digital files of American history and culture. Thousands of researchers visit the library annually to study firsthand our unparalleled collections, which include many materials that cannot be found anywhere else, the unique copyright deposit of America, and the world's largest collections, not just of books and periodicals, but of maps, music, and movies. 
We do massive preservation work, notably at the library's new Packard Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper, Virginia, and through the congressionally mandated National Digital Information Infrastructure and Preservation Program, which we direct and coordinate with 176 partners, including the archives and the Smithsonian. When the library moved out of the Capitol and into the new Jefferson Building in 1897, Congress made it clear that the interior space was designed to be not only a library, but a public showcase with exhibitions where visitors could go to be inspired by the quest for knowledge as an essential part of our knowledge-based democracy. With a recent renovation by Congress of the Jefferson Building, our flagship building, and our introduction last year of interactive enhancements of the public spaces and popular exhibits, we have honored that important balance serving both the scholarly community and the general public. Uh, <clears throat> the facilities for the scholarly community have actually been expanded with the addition through private funds of our, of our Kluge uh, Center. The Library of Congress has also been an innovator in the Internet age, superimposing new digital collections and services onto the traditional analog ones, reaching out to the young generation and to lifelong learners to stimulate curiosity and creativity wherever they live. We featured beginning in the mid-1990s free digital access to our collections, putting online both our American Memory National Digital Library and Thomas, our legislative database. This year we added a world digital library in seven languages with some material covering all 192 members of UNESCO. Uh, we also provide online resources targeted specifically for K-12 through students and teachers using our primary source documents. Uh, our website usage has increased 6,000% since 1996. The library, uh, Mr. Chairman, like America itself, adds the new without discarding the old. We continue to maintain a balance in serving Congress and the scholarly community while welcoming, <clears throat> thanks to the passageway from the new Capital Visitors Center, visitors both on-site as well as online to this unique storehouse, both of the world's knowledge and of America's cultural and intellectual creativity. Thank you very much for inviting me today, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank ask. you so much, Dr. Billendy. <clears throat> during my college days, I also remember the Library of Congress having a pretty good law library. I mm -hmm. guess you still do. Yes, we Thank are. all of the panel uh, for their testimony. And then I, now I recognize my friend from Ohio, Mr. Driehaus, to begin the questioning. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank all the witnesses. Uh, you represent three of the most important institutions, obviously, in the United States, and appreciate the tremendous work. And, and Mr. Ferrero, uh, welcome, and I just add my congratulations uh, to everyone else's. Uh, this question is to you. Uh, last week, the Director of Office of Management and Budget uh, issued an open government directive that requires agencies to take a number of actions to improve access to government information. Under the directive, each agency must take steps to reduce its backlog of Freedom of Information Act requests by 10 percent each year. Uh, what actions will NARA take to reduce its Freedom of Information Act backlog as required by the Open Government Directive, and what other steps does NARA plan to take uh, to implement the directive? Just before I arrived, we, um, the agency established OGIS, um, which is the office that is charged with reducing the, um, this, this backlog and working um, with the agencies, the CIA and the Justice Department especially, to ensure that we're streamlining the process. The point person, uh, Miriam Nesbitt, who is going to head up this office, um, has been in place since the end of September. She's now building a staff and working very closely, um, especially with the CIA, CIA, looking at technological solutions to this problem. When you reference streamlining, can, can you give specific examples of, of what's being done to, to streamline the process? She's in the very beginnings of um, establishing new processes for, for speeding up the, um, these requests. Okay. Um, my, and I'd my, be happy to come back um, when we have something concrete to share. My, my other question gets to this balance between, um, you know, the, the role of the archives in collecting information and, and making that available to the public and the display. Um, Mr. Billington, the library, of, what, was talking about the, the role of the Library of Congress in the design uh, of the Jefferson Building in your testimony. You talk about 
the balance that is struck between uh, storing uh, the materials and, and also displaying uh, those materials for the public. Uh, Mr. Fr Mr. Ferreira, what, what do you believe is the balance for the archives? You know, is it the same as what we're trying to achieve in the Library of Congress, or is that balance different? Is the mission significantly different uh, such that you know, we don't do the same type of, we don't have the same type of emphasis on, on sharing and, and displaying the information as the library might have? I think we have similar missions. Um, we have different content that we're talking about. My content are the records of the United States, and I think we have the same responsibility to provide the, the museum and educational aspects of our mission as the Library of Congress does. This is the way we excite and interest a whole new generation of people. I'm, I'm looking especially at the K through 12 community about learning firsthand about this country, about getting a sense of excitement about our history. And nothing uh, can compare to looking at the physical, the real original documents. And it is, it is in service of training the next generation of researchers and scholars. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. I, I go to my friend from uh, North Carolina. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, and I appreciate you having this hearing, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I think this is an important discussion for us to have and for the Congress to be aware of these important documents that we have uh, uh, agencies taking care of. Uh, Mr. Feria, I certainly appreciate your appointment uh, and the credibility you bring to a very important agency and an agency in much need of strong leadership. And certainly appreciate your connection in North Carolina <laughs> as well, even though it is um, <clears throat> with Duke. Um, <laughs> uh, but um, as we've discussed in private, I, I, you know, discuss my concerns uh, about uh, some systemic issues with NARA. Now, granted, you've only been on the job a, a few days, um, but um, in May, before this committee, uh, the IG, Mr. Bratchfield uh, of NARA, uh, discussed the, the loss of, of sensitive data from your College Park location. And it, his... Um, what he said then was he saw an agency with a complete lack of internal controls, to, to paraphrase. Um, how, how are you going to address that? Security of the collections is um, high on my list of the issues that, that I have identified and we have started to work on. Security is, is, um, is something that every research collection deals with, and it's this tension between providing access to collections and protecting them. The security is um, a, a state of culture of vigilance that isn't a one-off one kind of operation where you come up with a set of recommendations and you've done security. It's something that you think about every day, every minute of your control of the collections. And that's the kind of urgency that I intend to create within the, within the agency. The Inspector General was correct. Um, the, the culture has resulted in a sense of uh, laxity uh, around security. And addressing that culture, it, it seems to me that security, when I think of security, it's when I go into the facility and you see the Constitution under, uh, under a lot of glass and some serious security, but the, the concerns that I have are, are in a warehouse. Um, and the disappearance of uh, many terabytes of information. It's interesting that I learned this year what a terabyte is. <laughs> and the discussions we have about that massive amount of information, and now uh, the, the story today about finding emails from the Bush administration. Um, and, and, and so there's been some losses, there have been some gains, but I think they show that there's a need of a cultural change, and I appreciate your willingness to address that. But w what are the substantive uh, steps you'll take to change the culture? We have, uh, we have established a holding security task force. We have uh, hired um, a person with security background to head up that team, and he has the authority, working with the inspector general, to... Uh, analyze the situation and come up with uh, a whole new set of security procedures and policies. 
And I should say that security is not um, the responsibility of just a few in the organization. Everyone who works for NARA has to have this sense of uh, vigilance around security. Mm -hmm. Okay, certainly. And that's um, not, this is another one of those areas where I will be happy to come back and report to the subcommittee on exactly what we've come up with. Okay. We've also had, uh, before your appointment, um, a discussion about the electronic records mm -hmm. um, and the, the ongoing changes there. Can you touch on that? Uh, it's sort of an uh, it's sort of an open-ended opportunity for you to discuss this because, in terms of of these on, these changes in technology, just in the last five years, I mean, I've got a um, you know a Kindle from Amazon.com, you know, and so that technology wasn't available five years ago. The BlackBerry today is much more powerful than the BlackBerry was five years ago, and on and on and on. So, how are you going to uh, establish this electronic records um, system? that we can continually update and, and it makes sense 20 years from now? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's another one of those um, challenges that's at the top of my list um, to figure out and get right. Um, this is a, a, an initiative that has um, started many years ago. In the, in the time that NARA launched this process, the technology has changed already. Um, the timeline needs to be shortened. The challenge is that every agency has been allowed to create their own electronic records management system with varying platforms and software packages and they don't talk to each other. So, so it's, it's a little more complicated than just in, ingesting all these electronic records. It's establishing a, a set of standards but primarily and philosophically at heart is the archives, the archivist, reassuming his responsibility for ensuring that the agencies are creating these systems and delivering in a way that we can deal with them. And that's something that there has been great laxity uh, in the past. No annual audits. And as you and I discussed, in most agencies, it is usually a junior person who has responsibility for records, uh, high turnover, bad, not uh, adequate training, and the archives hasn't stepped in to you know, exercise their authority. Well, thank you for your uh, straightforwardness on this and uh, your vig vigilance, and we wish you the best. And I don't want to paint a picture of this is a piece of cake and it's going to be easy to, easy to solve. It's not. Well, we're glad you're in, in charge, uh, and I know it's uh, certainly not an easy, uh, it, it, it's certainly a challenge, and a distinct challenge based on, on the culture you're walking into, and, and uh, these uh, electronic records in particular, and, and what that adds to this whole um, general challenge. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cuellar, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to welcome all three of y'all. We appreciate what y'all do, and Fierro, uh, also welcome. Um, let me talk, ask you one question for all of y'all. Uh, do y'all have a strategic plan for each of your agencies that is a strategic plan that has the core mission, that has the goals, that has the uh, indicators, the inputs, uh, and can you all make that available to us? Uh, Mr. Farrell? The archives does have one. It was uh, recent, it was updated just before I arrived. Um, it's not my strategic plan. Okay. Um, but I'll be happy to make it available to you. When you say it's not mine, I assume you're, you're gonna make some changes to it? I think a new archivist needs to establish himself in the agency and one of the ways of doing that is creating his own strategic plan. And is, and is there a way to measure your results? Every strategic plan should have, uh, should include evaluative measures. Yes. Good. Thank you. Mr. Clark? At the Smithsonian, you have our plan. It's in the materials. Maybe it's a new plan. I'm sorry. Uh, we have our plan, and it's in the materials that you have. And it's a plan that we just developed, and it took about a year to develop. We had a cultural problem also at the Smithsonian, and so we wanted to make it an inclusive process to get people to buy in to the plan and we finished that and we're very pleased with the way the results have come out. 
Uh, we do. We are required by our Board of Regents to have very explicit goals and measurables against those goals. And so we have goals that we expect to be measured against over the life of the plan, which is basically 2010 to 2015, but also annual goals. And of the annual goals, we actually measure our progress towards those goals every quarter. Okay, good. Uh. <clears throat> We have, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we're halfway through our current strategic plan, and we are uh, engaged, I've been engaged in a virtually year-long process of revising it and extending it to 2016. Uh, we're nearly finished that exercise. We've been conducting a, um, a really thorough review as well as a review of our management agenda, and um, uh, it will have some new emphases, and we will get you a, a copy of this as it's almost complete, and we'll get it to you uh, as soon as you want it. Or you, it, it will be, however, a revision <clears throat> of the basic strategic plan that, uh, that we've been operating under for two and a half years. That's the normal thing is to mid-course re-examination of your strategic plan, which is what we've been doing, and we've decided that this change, the changes should be fairly significant and last through 2016. Okay. Um, and I would ask you all, because uh, I, I heard Ms. Cronk what you said, I just got a copy, it was not attached to your state uh, testimony, I just got it right now, but th there is no measurements in what percentage. Is that in a different document? Because one of the things I want to see our federal agencies uh, in doing is to have the mission, the goals, and then what you're trying to measure because I I'm looking at what just got provided to me and, and I don't see any performance measures. And why would you put them apart from this strategic plan? The, the plan that we, the executive summary of the plan speaks to what we will measure but not exactly what we would measure because we felt it would just be too much detail for the average person but that's all available in public records and we have in fact what we try to do as we develop the plan was to bring our all of our st our stakeholders meaning not just those at the smithsonian but those outside the smithsonian into the process of deciding what we should measure and so that is available and it's part me, of the, and we can make that available to you yes sir thank you and i appreciate all the work that y'all do give me an idea from each of y'all what y'all measure what As do we measure no. yeah just wanna, like sorry. what um okay let's start with sorry how many people come through the door um, but more interesting and more valuable are qualitative kinds of measurements. How effective was the visit? Um, did you get what you need? What, um, how, how qualified are the staff that you, that, um, you interact with? Um, what did you learn from the, the experience? And then there are um, measures on resource, um, use of resources. Right. Mr. Clark. Uh, somewhat similar for us in that, for example, for a museum visit, uh, we survey our visitors and we have a standard to which we aspire for uh, visitors saying this was an excellent visit or this was a very good visit, this was informative to me in, in a particular way. And so we have those kind of measures. We also look at the number of people uh, who come, the number of people who come to our websites, how long they stay, uh, what they tell us that they are learning. We, we're looking for more of a two-way exchange today as opposed to us simply measuring some temperature, but literally letting them tell us uh, what they think. Right. And we look for and, and, management expertise, as well, right. excellence and, and, as well. And my time is out, but let, let me just say this. I, I would ask you all to, you know, one of the things about the measurements is that I, I don't want to get caught up in measuring activity, you know, how many pencils you have, or I mean, as a very simplistic idea, uh, examples. Uh, it, I would ask your staff that's sitting behind you is that we measure the end results, the goals mm -hmm. uh, to do that, because it's easy to measure activity. Uh, but if, you know, once you set your mission and your strategic goals, it, how do we measure the end results? You know, what's the results? In other words, uh, you can say, how do you improve education? And there are certain things you look at by just counting how many teachers you have. So uh, I'd love to sit down with you all because I'm a big believer in having federal agencies to do a lot more on the deeper thinking of strategic uh, planning on this. So, but first of all, I just want to again say thank you to all three. We really appreciate the work that you and your staff are doing. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The uh, gentlewoman from the District of Columbia, Mrs. Norton, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing um, 
uh, all three of these um, kinship agencies uh, before us. Uh, they are very important to the District of Columbia, but exquisitely important to the nation of the 20 million people or so who come to visit the nation's capital every year. Many do, in fact, visit all three of these institutions. I have um, questions. That, let me begin with uh, you, Mr. Fierro. You are the uh, junior member of the trilogy here. Uh, and I welcome you and congratulate you on your appointment. I congratulate you on the work and the exhibits that are up now and on, on, on your coming Civil War exhibition, which uh, is much anticipated. Uh, I strongly endorse uh, the transformation that's been underway for some time so that the archives uh, loses that aura. The word archives sends <laughs> out the message, not for anybody I know. It's, I was a history major, so it would have interested me. Uh, but it is um, uh, unfortunate that it does not fully describe in any sense what the archives means uh, to uh, anyone even mildly interested in our country. Uh, so I, I very much applaud what you are doing. I see the archives much more as a museum, like the Smithsonian Museum, frankly that if you come here, you ought to go to the archives just the way you go to the Library of Congress to say this that I've heard all my life about. Let me see what really happens in here. Let me look at it. Very same thing for the archives. Now, I'm not suggesting a name change here, but I am suggesting that you are um, transforming how, uh, and this has been underway for some time. Now, uh, I'm not sure Congress has uh, been fully aware of how that transformation, how you keep up with that transformation. Because in the real sense, it seems to me we're still back into the old archives business and making sure that you do the filing <laughs> and that scholars can find what they need. Far be it for me to say that isn't important. Uh, but the fact is that you serve the entire country. Uh, and I, uh, there was a question asked by one of my colleagues about the so-called balance. Let's, let, let me pick out one of the things you do to, to ask you whether or not Congress needs to look more carefully at a transformation of its own, perhaps. If uh, you go before an immigration court, you don't have any rights. I mean, you are not in the country, <laughs> figuratively speaking, yet. You are challenging some kind of order. So you, uh, we have an immigration court and you don't have discovery there. As I understand it, if you want to find out anything about what the government, the other side, who is in court with you, has on you, you've got to do a FOIA request. Uh, and I understand these requests, uh, which are very important, just, uh, just as the, the kind of request we had in mind when we pass for you uh, or an active for, for you were important. Uh, but somebody, whether somebody stays in the country or leaves, whether or not there's false information regarding whether the person has, has been involved in some activity, terrorist or not, is what the government is relying on. That also is important. I don't know how you prioritize among the for, for your requests or what, uh, uh, or whether you are in, in have any st strategy for keeping yourself from being buried in for your requests, whether you've asked for uh, a different way to handle for your requests, perhaps outside of the archives, whether you've asked for more funding or staff to handle it, or are you just sitting there letting the for your requests come in and somebody go look when when she gets ready to gets down to, to you. And of course, if they get to the case, and I'm not suggesting all of these cases are full of, of, of content, uh, but obviously they have the right to the FOIA because the courts do consider them if they happen <laughs> to get the information in time. But guess what? If you don't get it in time, since you don't have a right to discovery, off with your head. What does the archives do when it sees, I won't even call it new, but a, a, a certainly not anticipated, uh, use, 
piling in on you? Is this, are there more FOIA requests of this kind than any other FOIA requests? What are you doing about it? You're asking very good questions. And um, as I said, the this new OGIS um, operation that's been set up in the archives is charged with speeding up and reducing the time to process those kinds of requests. I don't have concrete information about um, the nature of requests, but I can get that information and supply it. Um, and this is, you know, in my three and a half weeks. Is this it is, the largest number of This is the FOIA first requests? I've heard about this category of FOIA requests. So, um, I, well, I, first I, blush. I think it is, I, 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 I'm suggesting, uh, you, you know, you, you can get all the money you want to. There's certain kinds of things you'll never get enough money to handle. And I think you ought to have um, your staff and your counsel looking at whether or not you ought to suggest uh, that either some minimal rights be granted to people uh, before immigration courts, right. w which is in the jurisdiction of the Congress, or that something else be done, because I do not see a way for you to get on top of what is an ever uh, increasing number, nor do I think that the taxpayers of the United States ought to keep pouring money into something of the kind if there's another way to do it. I notice your budget has doubled with respect to presidential libraries. I wonder if that's getting some kind of preference over the last 10 years, some kind of preference over other kinds of things, because after all, they are presidents. Well, we've case? just submitted just I mean, before. Have you had a doubling of your budget in any other part of what you do? Um, not that I'm aware of. Uh, although the budget has kept up with the increasing volume of material that, that the archives was responsible for. Say that again. Every year the archives brings in more and more content mm -hmm. and the budget has increased to support that. Um, in, in terms of the presidential libraries, the staff prepared just before I arrived and submitted a report on the future of the presidential libraries which spells out um, five different scenarios for investigation. And I would expect that we would have a uh, hearing on that in the new year to talk about the future of the presidential mm -hmm. libraries. I think that requires our attention, Mr. Chairman, because it's another area that could just run away with us. After all, these presidential libraries are supposed to be supported by their own foundations as well. Uh, the taxpayers here in, in the archives do have some responsibility, but it's, it strikes me very, it is very interesting to me that the, that that budget has grown, has doubled. Um, it I, is it is a public-private partnership. Sure. So the, the libraries are built by private foundations, and, and the, the foundations over to have to know that they have to keep working hard. And if they see the government taking on more and more of it, there will be a disincentive there. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Clough a, a, a question. Uh, the, the last time I looked, seventy percent of the funding of the Smithsonian. Uh, was from the United States government. Is it about that percentage now? Yes, it's about 65 percent by federal appropriations and 35 percent. I have been very private. concerned with with uh, the uh, fundraising um, record mm -hmm. of the Smithsonian. Here we have the most <laughs> uh, unusual, I would call it, a unique collection of museums. Uh, nothing like it in the world. Any city that had it in, in its midst would regard it as a treasure trove. I am struck dumb by why the Smithsonian has not been able to raise uh, more private funds uh, from across the United States. I need to know what your fundraising um, model is, considering that I do not expect that the United States Congress is going to raise the percentage uh, we can hardly keep up with your backlog of, uh, of uh, repairs and alterations. Well, we're working hard on getting the message out about the Smithsonian and telling the correct story about the purposes that it serves to the American people and the world. This past year, yeah, well, our goal was re relatively ambitious. Sir? I'm sorry. What, what, what's the fun? Is there? Is there? Uh, you know, if you go to places like New York, yes. You know, where you have major museums, yes that have major fundraising strategies, even yes. though they, the, the, the city of New York supports them. Uh, is there uh, such a strategy there besides telling people this is, you know, let, let them know the kinds of things they can see here? That is not going to raise funds. We are very close to having all the pieces in place. Uh, the first part was to develop our strategic plan, which we did, and that is now public. 
And then from that, we build what we call our case statement, which is we have goals that we think that the American people and members of Congress and others support for us. And then uh, we try to identify the targets for people who, corporations, foundations, and so forth, who would support us. And this past year, uh, we were pleasantly surprised. We had a goal of $120 million in private philanthropy, and we raised 127. Uh, so we did better than we expected on that side. We think with the strategic plan in place and with a, a definite ef concerted effort to reach out to the American people, we will do better. And our goal is to have a national campaign, and you well know from having your university experience that that takes a structure which we've not had. We are in the process of working with our regents to put that in place. Uh, and by the end of the year, we should have not only the ideas, but also the structure in place to actually get this done. So I think you can look for better results from us uh, shortly. The, the gentlewoman's time has expired, and perhaps that is a, the subject of an, another hearing. I think so, Mr. Chairman, if I may request a fundraising hear, hearing on the private fundraising of okay. uh, all three, uh, but especially the Smithsonian, uh, uh, and the, the words national campaign were uttered, yeah. uh, you come from the academic, uh, so staff you know what it will, means. Staff will work with you. Exactly. Mr. Chairman, if I may say so, um, uh, otherwise the pressure is going to be on us to do something which we will not do. Okay. You already are charging to get in the so-called butterfly exhibit. The Congress of the United, the 20 million people who come here are our constituents. We pay for this um, whole array. And the notion of charging to get in any part of it is anathema to us. So I regard the butterfly exhibit uh, we will, we as, will examine as, those as an outrage and, and ask and you others. to get private funds for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, let me ask uh, Dr. Clough, um, what can Congress do to support the work of our three great cultural institutions uh, in fulfilling what you described in your testimony as our, as your collective mission. What can we do to be of help? Well, I think it's a joint effort, a collective partnership between yourselves and us uh, and the American people uh, to, uh, to, to fulfill our mission, so which I think are fundamental and, and very important to our history and to uh, uh, the generations that will follow. Uh, I think, uh, as was indicated by Dr. Fario, that uh, I think Congress does a, a good job in terms of supporting our missions financially. Obviously, we could use additional funds because it's a struggle to find that balance between, if you will, the security and the access type of, of the equation, and we deal with that every day. But we're very appreciative of the support we do get from Congress. Uh, this past year in FY10, for example, we got $2 million in addition to the funds that we had before to help us with collections care and security of our collections, and we very much appreciated that. But I think working collectively together, thinking together about the future of these institutions and making sure we're all headed in the right direction is a powerful way to go forward. Thank you for that response. Dr. Billington, uh, you write in your statement that the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and the National Archives complement each other. In your opinion, is there room for more cooperation between these three institutions? especially in leveraging each one's inherent strengths, uh, both organizationally and in your collections? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, I think there, I think there is. I think that um, there are fundamental, uh, clear, fairly clear lines in the sense of the official record of the U U.S. government is in the archives. The Smithsonian has a vast array of things, but generally speaking, covering many of the areas that we do, but in a different way. I mean, they tend to have three-dimensional objects for exhibition. We tend to have two-dimensional records, whether it's films. Well, they have films too, but there's, um, there's some duplication, but there's room, uh, there's a fairly distinct division of labor, which I think we all more or less honor. Um, and uh, so I think, but I think there is room for more collaboration. They will, we all report to different committees, of course. I mean, you were mentioning that, I mean, in terms of private fundraising, we never even had a development office before I became a librarian. We, uh, we, got, we get uh, donations 
Um, but um, our staff is very small. We have no board of governors, so there's no board of, uh, to, to help us in this regard. Um, but we've, we've got two major donations, one from Mr. Kluge to set up a Kluge Center that, that um, uh, is really a great additional boon to bring major scholars here um, for, for their work. And we also got this unprecedented gift from the Packard Humanities Institute that's been able us to create this audiovisual conservation center, which has been able to bring, bring back the world's largest collection of recorded sound, films, all in one place. They've been scattered. Okay. But that's a consolidation, and I think there is additional work we do, and I would hope we can, we'll have more conversations among ourselves to see if we can't, uh, we can't um, uh, work together even more specifically than we have in the past. Thank you for that response. And Dr. Ferriero, uh, along the same lines as Ms. Norton's question, uh, presidential libraries now make up about a third of NARA's uh, budget, and yet the backlog of FOIA requests at the libraries are years long and growing every year. It is estimated that it will take 100 years to process just the Reagan Library materials, and the Bush and Clinton libraries are facing similar issues. Uh, NARA continues to renovate not only aging buildings, but relatively young permanent museum exhibits and educational programs, including using cutting edge technology and design. Is the presidential library system focused on the right priorities? Well, as I, as I said, this is the subject of, um, I think, a future hearing. Uh, I can tell you, in terms of resources, the museum aspect of the presidential libraries is, is, is about 4% of the budgets of the presidential libraries. So in terms of, of resource allocation, um, it's, it's the appropriate balance. The, the, um, the issue around um, maintenance and upkeep is one of the big issues in terms of the long-term future of the presidential library system. These are um, facilities that, uh, with any decentralized system, over time require uh, maintenance and upkeep. And the, they're, one, they're 13, soon to be 13, of uh, more than 40 facilities that that I'm responsible for around the country. Let me ask you about the, um, the FOIA request. Uh, last week, the director of the Office of uh, Management and Bu Budget issued an open government directive that requires agencies to take a number of actions to improve access to government information. Under the directive, each agency must take steps to reduce its backlog of FOIA requests by 10% each year. What actions will NARA take to reduce this FOIA backlog as required by the Open, open Government Directive, and what other steps does NARA plan to take to implement the directive? Well, as I said, this, this new office that we've set up is charged with um, specifically looking at that and making a set of recommendations about how we can reduce that backlog. Okay. All right. Well, I, I look forward to... Uh, to working with you in that capacity and, and all of, of, of the uh, responsibilities of NARA. Uh, welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, let me thank the entire panel for their testimony. And uh, you are dismissed, and we will call forward the second panel. Thank you.
Are we ready? It is the uh, policy of the subcommittee to swear in all witnesses. Uh, would you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear? Do you uh, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Seated. Let the record reflect that the, the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And uh, let me find my page. I would now like to introduce our second panel. Our first witness will be Ann L. Wise Wiseman, Chief Counsel for Citizens for Responsibility in, and Ethics in Washington, uh, otherwise known as CRU, uh, a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting transparency and accountability in government and public life. Uh, Ms. Wiseman earlier served as Def Dep Deputy Chief of the Enforcement Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission. Prior to that, as Assistant Branch Director of the Civil Division of the, of the Department of Justice, she had supervisory responsibility over litigation under FOIA, the Privacy Act, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, and statutes governing federal and presidential records. Ms. Wiseman received her BA magna cum laude from Brown University and her JD from George Washington University's National Law Center. And welcome to the subcommittee. Uh, our next witness is Janet A. Alpert, president of the National Gene Genealogical Society, a service organization that leads and educates the National Gene Genealogical uh, community and promotes access to and preservation of genealogical records. Ms. Alpert is an amateur genealogist who has been researching her family for almost 30 years. In 2004, she retired from a 35-year career in the title insurance industry. She received a BA degree in political science from the University of California at Santa Barbara and an MBA from the University of Connecticut. And thank you for being here. And our next witness, uh, will be Kevin Goldberg, legal counsel for the American Society of News Editors. Mr. Goldberg's ex expertise is in First Amendment, copyright, and trademark issues, and he regularly advocates issues involving freedom of speech on behalf of press organizations. In 2006, he was an inducted into the National Freedom of Information Hall of Fame for his continued and superlative service in pursuit of open government. Mr. Goldberg earned a BA degree from James Madison University and graduated with high honors from George Washington University uh, Law School. Thank you for being here, Mr. Goldberg. And our final witness will be Mr. Carl Malamud, a president and founder of Public uh, dot resource dot org, a nonprofit corporation that makes government information more broadly available on the internet, including over 90 million pages of documents and 1,000 videos. The organization has been leading a national effort called Law.gov to make America's primary legal materials more broadly available. Mr. Malamud previously served as Chief Technology Officer at the Center for American Progress in the 1990s. He ran the first radio station on the Internet and was responsible for putting the SEC, Edgar, and patent databases online. Uh, he is the author of eight professional reference books and numerous articles and has been a visiting professor at the MIT Media Lab and Keough University. I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimony. And Ms. Wiseman, we will start with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the mission of the National Archives and Records Administration at this critical juncture. As Chief Counsel for CRU, we have been pushing NARA for years to assume the leadership role Congress envisioned for the agency through the Federal Records Act. Today, NARA must make some key decisions. The appointment of Dr. Ferriero as the new archivist. The appointment of Dr. Ferriero as the new archivist and the administration's dedication to a transparent and accountable government present NARA with unique opportunities to re-examine its mission and priorities and establish a new roadmap for how to achieve them. 
Most importantly, the archivist must decide whether NARA will continue to elevate its role as a museum of the nation's history over its role as a records access agency, the question this committee has posed. This juncture also affords Congress an opportunity to re-examine the laws that govern record keeping in the executive branch. First, the dismal state of electronic record keeping across nearly all agencies in the federal government cries out for a new direction from NARA. As documented in a report we issued in April 2008 and the periodic reports from the GAO, to date, NARA has failed to affirmatively and effectively assist agencies in developing and implementing effective records management policies. The GAO's June 2008 report notes specifically that NARA's failure to conduct inspections of agency record management programs since 2000 leaves us with limited assurances that agencies are appropriately managing the records in their custody and that important records are not lost. We at CREW are confronted with this problem all the time as agencies tell us repeatedly in response to our FOIA requests that they simply have no way to access and search their electronic email records. Although this failure has now reached a crisis point, NARA continues to abdicate its statutory responsibilities and fails to recognize the urgency of the situation, opting instead time and again for a more passive role that avoids any direct conflict with the agencies it oversees. NARA justifies its failure to take on a more active role, excuse me, role as resulting from the limited enforcement authority that the FRA confers on it, but we strenuously disagree and urge Mr. Ferrio to reevaluate the need for additional legislative authority only after NARA exercises the full authority it already has. <coughs> excuse me. Second, we urge NARA to conduct an independent audit of the Electronic Records Archive, or ERA. <coughs> I apologize. Ex including an analysis of its status, functionality, and feasibility. Launched in 2001, <coughs> the ERA has been promised as the answer to the long-term preservation of electronic records. But in the intervening years, we have seen huge cost overruns, multiple instances of contractor mismanagement, and growing doubt about whether the ERA is capable of delivering on this promise. And just as critically, NARA has yet to tackle the issue of public access to records once they make their way into the system. Such an audit also has to consider the actions of the contractor Lockheed Martin and answer questions about its conduct. Why, for example, has Lockheed Martin applied for numerous patents related to the ERA despite the fact that the project is entirely federally funded? Even more fundamentally, should NARA even continue with the ERA given its problems to date? We ask the new archivist to take a clear-eyed look at this question and, if necessary, have the courage to abandon the project if it cannot deliver on its promises. Third. NARA suffers from a culture of passivity that has prevented it from becoming an effective leader in the management and preservation of our nation's history. <clears throat> and I'm pleased that Dr. Ferrier recognizes these problems. With each day, month, and year that goes by without effective hit management, <clears throat> we lose another slice of our history. President Obama has promised an unprecedented level of transparency and accountability. But this promise cannot be fulfilled if agencies fail to preserve agency records. <clears throat> In short, the status quo is unacceptable. We ask NARA now to reinvigorate and redefine itself as part of the solution, not the problem. We also ask that Congress consider legislative amendments that we've, I have outlined in my written testimony that would add a measure of accountability and provisions that would better ensure compliance. Crew welcomes the opportunity to work with this committee and the new leadership at NARA. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wiseman. And we look forward to working with Crew. Uh, Ms. Alpert, you may proceed for five minutes. Good afternoon, Chairman Clay and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to testify before the subcommittee today. My name is Janet A. Alpert, and I'm the president of the National Genealogical Society. Our members range from family history researchers to professional genealogists. 
The genealogical community is well represented in this room today. The following points are more fully described in my written statement, which has been presented to the subcommittee. Additional statements of support and concern from other genealogy groups are available on our website at www.ngsgenealogy.com. The National Archives and Records Administration is a very important source of original records for the genealogical community. As a result, we are their largest research user group. The National Genealogical Society supports the mission of NARA, but we are concerned that the two most important priorities, to safeguard and preserve the records of our government and to ensure the continuing access to the essential documentation, are becoming secondary to the third tenet of the mission, to promote civic education and historical understanding of our national experience. Several examples support our position. NARA has a backlog of documents which have not been processed and many more records which will be coming to NARA for processing and safeguarding over the next few years. We are not aware of any plans to accommodate the increasing volume of records. It is important for the major collections to stay at the National Archives building in Washington, D.C., because people who travel here to do research need easy access to the other collections at the Library of Congress, the Smithsonian, and the DAR Library. Second, the extensive record groups at NARA requires skilled experts to assist researchers. Due to budget cutbacks, staff reductions, and retirements, we believe the skill level of the staff is diminishing rather than increasing. Three, Plans are underway to reduce the research area so the museum and exhibit area can be expanded. Continued access to microfilm and adequate research space is necessary until more of the records are digitized and available online. Four, NARA has shown leadership in developing partnerships with third parties to digitize many records which are very valuable to genealogists. However, we are not aware of plans to make these digitized records available to the public for free over the NARA website at the end of the five-year contract period. So as to the question, History Museum or Records Access Agency, from what we have heard, some of the planned exhibits will duplicate records already available online through local libraries, and they may misrepresent the complexity of the research process. We support civic education, and we think it can best be accomplished at the national and regional archives through hands-on workshops with student groups and teacher training on using documentary sources in the classroom. We believe it would be more cost-effective to spend the money building interactive learning and exhibits online, which would reach the broader public, not just people who visit the National Archives in Washington, D.C. There are already many wonderful museums along the Capitol Mall, yet there is only one unique collection of original records at the National Archives. In summary, we recommend that the new United States archivist, David Ferriero, takes both appropriate short-term action and establish long-term strategies that support the priorities of records preservation and access. We also hope he will include genealogists in the planning process. The genealogical community stands ready to support the archivist in building a world-class research facility and model for emerging democracies around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Alpert, for that testimony. Mr. Goldberg, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman Clay, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of the Sunshine and Government Initiative, a coalition of nine media organizations that includes the American Society of News Editors. Mr. Chairman, as you well know, SGI and ASNE have a long history of working with this subcommittee on issues relating to the proper management and distribution of government information. We are here today to, find the, to define the challenges facing the National Archives and Records Administration in fulfilling its mission in this area. NARA's mission mandates that the agency ensures that the people can discover, use, and learn from America's documentary heritage. The democracy, civic education, and historical understanding functions of the agency's mission statement are impossible without public access to records created not just decades ago, but on a continuing basis. Now, a much quoted visionary for government transparency, former Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, saw an active and informed public as critical to a healthy democracy. Those who won our independence, Brandeis wrote, 
believe that public discussion is a political duty and that this should be a fundamental principle of American government. Having previously declared that sunlight is said to be the best of disinfectants, Justice Brandeis also clearly saw access to government information as democracy's oxygen. You cut off its supply, democracy dies. Ensuring access to information is central to SGI's mission. It is one of ASE's core values. But 43 years after FOIA's passage, obtaining government information in a speedy or low cost fashion can still be difficult, if not impossible, for a reporter from a major daily newspaper, let alone the average citizen. That is why today's hearing is so important. Ensuring NARA's dedication to distributing its own records and its newly vested ability to assess other executive branch agencies' disclosure decisions is vital to our democracy. First, NARA must perfect its own access policies and activities. The agency, like so many others, has significant processing backlogs. NARA issued a FOIA improvement plan on October 16, 2006, in which it claimed it responded to 76% of all FOIA requests within the statutorily mandated 20-day response period. Well, Mr. Chairman, that falls into the C range on a 100-point grading scale. That's satisfactory, but I wasn't treated too kindly by my parents when I brought home C's. NARA rightly notes that resources to address FOIA were reduced as FOIA requests increased. But part of the problem is that the agency does not appear to have fully implemented its own recommendations made in 2006. There are several links to NARA reference guides and to the archival research catalog, but the legally mandated access to actual records via NARA's electronic reading room appears limited and unimproved since 2006. The need for NARA to get its own house in order is more significant now that Congress has entrusted the agency with a new office designed to deal with the public and other agencies to make FOIA work better. NARA must lead by example as the Office of Government Information Services becomes a key contact point for the public on FOIA and reviews other agencies' compliance with FOIA. For this hearing, I want to emphasize that for OGIS to be effective, the archivist must embrace OGIS's active engagement with other agencies in the public. OGIS can first help unburden agencies from their FOIA requests by pushing agencies to put more information online without waiting for a request. More information online means fewer burdensome requests. As requesters understand that they have an ally in this new office, they will reach out to OGIS for assistance and education. This should result in faster processing as OGIS quickly resolves imprecise or misconstrued requests. Finally, OGIS intervention should be able to head off litigation when parties are simply at an impasse. But OGIS's effectiveness in making FOIA work better for federal agencies and the public will ultimately hinge on whether the office receives the proper support from the National Archives as a whole. This support rests on two key components, funding and independence. OGIS was appropriated $1 million in fiscal year 2009 and a budget of $1.4 million for fiscal year 2010. That money has allowed the office to hire a total of six employees. The office will eventually need more staff to accomplish its goals. This is why the Congressional Budget Office estimated OGIS would require a budget of $3 million in its first year and about $6 million each year thereafter to be fully functional. As important as proper funding is a commitment to OGIS independence. The combination of independence and record-keeping acumen is the main reason Congress housed this office within the National Archives. We hope that OGIS Director Miriam Nisbet and her staff will be given the trust and leeway needed to develop OGIS. We thank you for the opportunity to present our views on the future of the National Archives and the importance of this new OGIS office to the agency's mission. I welcome your questions. Thank you so much, Mr. Goldberg. Mr. Malamon, you're up for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Clay, members of the subcommittee. I'm particularly honored to be here today following not only our dynamic new archivist, but also the Secretary of the Smithsonian and the Librarian of Congress. Your invitation to testify asked me to discuss NARA's mission to preserve and ensure access to records and asked if I believe the agency's efforts in exhibits and other programs influence that performance. When President Hoover laid the cornerstone for the National Archives building, he stated there will be aggregated here the most sacred documents of our history, the originals of the Declaration of Independence and of the Constitution of the United States. The display of the Declaration of Independence and of the Constitution are certainly a visible symbol of our National Archives, but they are merely a symbol. It is a preservation of records and the corollary processes of gathering those records from the agencies and making them available to the public that are the core challenges of this unique institution. The electronic records archives are certainly the biggest challenge facing the archivist. 
This $551 million computer system has had a long history of false starts. Just last month, both the GAO and NARA's own Inspector General testified to this committee they have no idea what the system does, how it works, and where the money went. We do know that after $237 million spent to date, the system has no backup and restore capabilities. We do know that public access to ERA is an afterthought. And we do know that the contractor, Lockheed Martin, has taken out 15 patent applications on the system. With a half billion dollars in taxpayer money on the line, it goes without saying that the software should be open source so that any state archivist could run the same system. The ERA system is so complex because of the incoming deluge of electronic records. When the National Archives was being created, archivist Connor faced a similar situation. At first, the archives were similarly unable to keep up. Archivist Connor instituted a series of changes, moving the examiners closer to the source and providing better guidance and standardized forms and schedules to the agencies. For many years now, records management has been sorely neglected. Guidance has been limited to telling agencies to print and save, and a recent survey shows no agency-wide policies for important archives, such as electronic mail. It was heartening to hear archivist Ferriero list this area as one of his key concerns, stating that he would reinstitute agency inspections and that NARA should play a leadership role. In addition to electronic records, one of the key challenges facing NARA is digitization of older materials. Looking back again at archivist Connor, we see that NARA dealt with an incoming deluge of paper records by pioneering an important set of technical advances, including the development of microfilm. Digitization of paper and other materials should be a key priority for NARA, as well as the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress, and the Government Printing Office. In 1935, NARA secured President Roosevelt's support to get WPA funding to employ white-collar workers to survey federal archives. Recovery.gov shows no stimulus funding for NARA. And in the midst of the current depression, there is a tremendous opportunity to put people to work by creating public works for the digital age, an opportunity France seized just this Monday, announcing $1.1 billion in stimulus funding to scan their national library. It is instruct, um, instead of viewing digitization of materials as an opportunity, the archives has declared the task to be out of scope and has created as an alternative a series of public-private partnerships with organizations such as Amazon.com. It is my understanding from NARA officials that a similar arrangement may be in the works in which a large number of congressional hearings would be scanned by LexisNexis and made available on that retail information system. In his opening statement and his confirmation, archivist Ferriero also quoted archivist Connors and his observation that 45% of the records he surveyed were infested with vermin and insects and that records mingled higgledy-piggledy with empty whiskey bottles. This was a defining moment for the new institution and I think the National Archives faces another defining moment today. Thank you. Thank you so much for that testimony. Uh, let me start with, with uh, Ms. Wiseman, in your testimony, Mr. Malama mentioned it also. Um, you bring up the fact that NARA's ERA contractor, Lockheed Martin, has applied for 15 patents related to the program, which is taxpayer funded. Uh, can you please explain your concern? Uh, that you have with the contractor applying for patents? Well, I, I share Mr. Malamud's concern that this should be open source material. It's, it's just uh, inexplicable to me why it is that it's the subject of private patents. If it's, and if it were patentable, why the government doesn't hold those patents and not a contractor. We're not talking about a system that's been built with commercially off-the-shelf software. Um, you know, it is being developed and built entirely with federal funds. And I think it speaks to the larger concern I alluded to, which is NARA's failure to effectively oversee the contractor. And I know that the Inspector General at NARA, who I guess has testified before this committee, has also written some reports. And I think they detail his concerns as well. And it's, it's hard to really get to the bottom of it, except that at a minimum, it, it appears at least to crew that NARA just does not have the technical and other know-how 
to effectively and adequately supervise this contract. And I think that's why here we are, lo these many years later and these many, many millions of dollars later, um, raising a question about whether we should even continue or abandon this project. Mr. Malama, did you want to have anything to add? Uh, very quickly, when, when uh, I think the National Archives has a role to play in managing not only its own archives, but in leadership to the archives in the 50 states and throughout the world. When they invented the, the microfilm and lamination and the airbrush in the 1930s, they didn't patent those and their contractors didn't, and it spread throughout our archival science. The ERA system is something that any state archive should be able to run, and most importantly, by making it open source, we can see how the system functions, make sure it's secure and make sure that it does the job that it's supposed to do. After all, it's our money as taxpayers that help pay for this. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that response. Going back to Ms. Wiseman, um, in your written testimony, you urged the new archivists to, to reevaluate the need for additional legislative authority only after exercising the full authority NARA currently has. Can you briefly explain what you meant by that statement? Yes, time and again when we have gone to NARA and urged it to take a stronger leadership role, they have suggested that they are limited because they have very limited statutory authority. One of the provisions of the Federal Records Act that we've dispute, had an ongoing dispute with them about in, on this issue is the obligation to conduct inspections. They don't do that. And agencies know that they're not going to be inspected for records compliance and we have massive non-compliance. And NARA has suggested time and again that it doesn't have the statutory authority to, to do anything more than it's already doing. If you look at the law, I think it's very clear. Congress envisioned, uh, not only envisioned, but commanded the archivists to conduct inspections. And I think this is yet one, one of uh, any number of examples where they have taken a very narrow view of their statutory authority you know, it's, it's kind of remarkable, really, because sometimes we're dealing with runaway agencies that have a very expansive view. But NARA seemingly does not want to take on these responsibilities. And frankly, it, it has seemed very risk adverse. It doesn't want to be in conflict. Um, but we really welcome um, the new archivist because it's our understanding that he shares the view that the problem is not a lack of statutory authority. It's a lack of will in exercising the authority they already have. Thank you for that response. Ms. Alpert, uh, how has the practice of genealogical uh, research changed and has NARA kept up with the needs of researchers in terms of resources, staffing, and records processing? Well, I think it's a, a continuation of this discussion about electronic records. Um, NARA was a leader, as one of the other panelists said, in the, in the 30s, and now so many of the records are going to be electronic. Uh, the new records are coming in electronically, and there are many, many records uh, behind the scenes that are still in paper uh, format, and they're actually, if you talk about pension records, they're actually in folders that are hundreds of years old. So I think uh, the real challenge for the archivist is how he takes NARA to the next generation and how he keeps up with this electronic challenge that he's got. And, and I think Mr. Malaman made a great suggestion as far as uh, directing some of the stimulus money towards uh, modernizing archivist r records. As, as genealogists, the WPA work that was done uh, exists on every county in the United States, and we use it often because they categorized a lot of the records that existed. So um, the work that was done in the 30s is, is still being used today. It was extremely valuable. Thank you for that response. Uh, and uh, let, me, let me say that before I ask Mr. Goldberg a question is that uh, we ask for the stakeholder community to uh, let you offer suggestions uh, to Dr. Ferriero and his staff uh, so that there can be a, a, a better uh, working relationship between the two entities, I mean, between several entities. Uh, and, and, and so I, I don't want this to appear to be adversarial in any way, but just suggestions uh, to the new archivists. Uh, as, as he enters this first phase uh, in his new position. Uh, Mr. Goldberg, in your testimony, you discussed the challenges facing 
the new Office of Government Information Services, or OGIS. Uh, what actions do you believe the new archivists can take immediately and in the long run uh, for OGIS to, to help meet its goals? Well, actually, this is a particularly apt question coming on your, your previous comment about an adversarial role. I actually think we have had our members of SGI have had a wonderful relationship not only with the new OGIS office, but with the, the National Archives as a, whole, as a whole. We worked very well with the prior archivists and hope that that continues. We have every reason to expect that it will continue. Um, in the short term, I think that the archivist must place his trust in this new office. There are some very talented people with there. We know Miriam both from her work in government and out of government. We know she's going to do the job. She's extremely knowledgeable about these issues. So one of the things he can actually do is sort of let her do that job. In terms of supporting her in that job and her staff, I think that comes in two areas. One, they, they really have to champion the funding. This office is drastically underfunded. Even state offices have more money and more employees allocated to them than this office has. Pennsylvania has about 10 full-time employees, Connecticut about 20 to accomplish the same tasks on a much smaller scale. I also think it's going to be important, if they can do it, to get this office back downtown. It's a wonderful facility in College Park, but these folks are going to have to meet with other agencies. I, you know, there was, there was just discussion in the prior panel about meetings with the CIA. Well, that means you have to get from CIA, from College Park to Langley. Anyone who's ever done that in rush hour traffic knows that's almost impossible to get things done. You waste half your day doing it. So I think that could really help them accomplish the mission if they have more accessibility to other agencies. Thank you for that, uh, for that answer. Mr. Goldberg, why is it important that NARA immediately address their processing uh, backlog? What is the practical impact of the backlog on transparency and open government? Well, for our members, primarily journalists and authors, it simply means that information doesn't get out to the public. It means that waiting for necessary information will either result in the shortcutting of deadlines, or the shortcutting of publication, or the missing of deadlines outright. In either case, the public is the one that loses out, as they, they lose valuable information that they would be reading in stories. I'll throw out another more indirect effect, and that is that for journalists and authors, they're going to now need to go more often to secondary sources to obtain information. Some of those people may not want to talk on the record. That really does our members a disservice in not being able to put the most credible publication forward, but also, of course, has led to other problems that we've seen in other areas needing, you know, needing the passage of a federal shield law, things like that to protect journalists that are covering government. I think that, that we could help all of these problems out by ensuring that more of the direct primary source information gets out to the public immediately. For that response, and uh, Mr. Malamut, you, uh, in a, a key item in several of these partnerships is that while not NARA may not provide free online access to, uh, to the digitized records for a period of several years, they may provide free access to them within NARA facilities. Uh, we have heard from researchers that NARA may not be providing enough space and resources within their facilities, but is there a larger problem here? Well, Mr. Chairman, let me first reiterate your thoughts about working with NARA. This, uh, um, there are no criticisms here. I've been very impressed by the new arc of this openness and, and frankness. Um, when you think about the NARA facilities, um, I think there's one every 10,000 square miles in the United States if you look at the total area. And if you look at the internet, um, NARA is everywhere on the internet. And today, public means online. Um, if we are going to make materials available, we have to make them available on the internet. And that's the problem I have when we put a five-year lean on the public domain materials, such as the deal with Amazon. You wrote in your testimony that the cost of scanning paper records uh, would de decrease dramatically on a larger scale. What are your thoughts on establishing such large uh, scanning projects and what would be the cost and benefits? 
Well, scanning is something that, that has several effects. First of all, it does provide public access. It also means that the, the storage requirements are significantly less. Uh, the state of the art today is about 10 cents a page for paper documents to scan them, run them through OCR, and make them available. I believe if NARA and the Library of Congress and others were to engage in large-scale scanning, that cost per page could get down to a nickel. Um, maybe even lower, and it's something that would have a tremendous benefit, and it would be, as I said before in my testimony, an enduring public work for our digital age. It's something that needs to be done, and I, I hope that the new archivist will embrace that challenge rather than um, looking at it as something that just can't be done. You, you know, you uh, in your in your comments, you talk about uh, there's one NARA facility for every 10,000 square miles in the U.S. You uh, you really concern me because both of them, both facilities that were mentioned today, I have an attachment to one being a Maryland Terrapin and having a facility in College Park. I'm very fond of that. And two, St. Louis houses the personnel record center. So we also found of that. And I guess it's just the nature of the beast. Uh, but you and Mr. Goldberg really raised concerns there if you talk about eliminating those. Let me. Uh, thank the panel uh, for their testimony today. Uh, and when staff initially proposed this hearing, uh, I figured it would just be another boring hearing, especially with the subject matter. But having a new archivist on board, we certainly welcomed him, and, and, and we are all inspired uh, by the future of the archives because of who is heading it now. Uh, we, and also, this panel raised some very interesting uh, issues that you made me aware of uh, and educated this committee on. Uh, so we are appreciative of, of that. Uh, and on that note, uh, this hearing is concluded. Thank you.